So our next presentation is by John Chastain, and he's going to be speaking about the production of fuel crops to make biodiesel using animal manure. Good morning. Uh, this is really a small project with a team up between myself and my extension economist, Wilder Ferreira. And it really came out of some of the questions being asked by our animal producers in South Carolina. And some of our unique things that are unique to South Carolina, maybe a little bit more unique to the southeastern part of the U.S. than maybe the Midwest. But there's folks in, I know for sure, the Dakotas that are very interested in growing something to make biodiesel. And that's what this was really looking at. Here's the motivating factors, but I, I mean, we've heard them all before. Increased fuel prices, emissions, greenhouse gases. But I underline the ones that the producers care about. They're looking at, looking at cost. What can we do to reduce our cost for diesel fuel to grow crops? And uh, so my objectives here is I'm going to quickly look at kind of a comparison between soybeans and canola. Soybeans is something we commonly produce in South Carolina. We, we have ready markets for it. Uh, uh, soybeans are canola is something we don't normally produce. We don't have ready markets for it. Yet we can produce it quite well. We do very well. With act actually, we do better in small grains than we do corn according to our climate. So that's something new we're looking at. And also I'm going to look at some of the cost savings related to using animal manure basically to grow that fuel crop and, uh, and using the nutrient source on the farm to basically produce biodiesel for on-farm use. We're actually blessed with a lot of biodiesel plants in the state of South Carolina. There's several places that I can drive to very short distance from my house and I can buy B20. But the reality is, is, in a lot of the easy sources for biodiesel are taken, you know, the, the restaurant waste, that kind of thing. So we're really looking at, you know, we really don't have enough. And so we're focusing on things to put in tractors to deal with grain deficit in our state to really get down to it. So is this a new idea? Actually, in actuality, Rudolph Diesel, when he first came out with the idea of a diesel engine, his original idea was that farmers would grow fuel. And the original diesel engine design worked great on peanut oil, soybean, all that kind of thing. And then later on we discovered petroleum. We actually modified engine design to basically work better on petroleum diesel. So this isn't a new, uh, a new idea. This was kind of from the beginning. And we're kind of thinking along the lines of Rudolph Diesel here. It can be made from vegetable oils, animal fats, most any biodegradable oil. And there's a lot on the process. A lot of those things we have, and there's a lot of people in our state getting on that market and making it. Um, it's a transesterification process. The main thing I want to point here is when all this began, people thought, oh, glycerin's a byproduct because it goes into soaps, makeup. Well, guess what? The market's flooded and it almost has no value. In fact, our only value for glycerin is carbon source for composting or other type of things. So we're not even counting glycerin as any kind of value. A couple of things that make it uh, favorable, it's degradable, it's renewable. It's, uh, in some ways, it's a better lubricant. It's got a lot of benefits for old engines, and so there's been a lot of work done, especially in other ag engineering departments around the country on that. You know, we've got to realize whenever we look at um, any kind of fuel crop, soybeans, canola, whatever, you know, there's a lot of energy that goes into making that crop. And there's been, a, and you know, that's why we say using waste oil or fat is better, but we're actually in an area where we're using a lot of those already. And I'm not saying that certain producers can't get it, but it's not as, it's, it's kind of caught on in our nick of the world, you might say. I'm not going to go through this, but I'm going to show the bottom line. There's several studies that look at energy ratios. Uh, soy biodiesel, without counting byproduct values, basically 1.5 to 1, the energy in the fuel relative to make it. Uh, with byproducts, soybean meal, it's about 3.9. Compare, compare that to petroleum diesel, it's 0.83. So in actuality, one of the pluses for biofuels, just on an energy balance standpoint, is it, it beats fossil fuel. So you think, well, why don't everybody do it? Well, energy ratio is not what controls the market price. Supply and demand doesn't. It really comes down to, do I have enough of a product that I can sell at a reasonable price and make a profit? And so that's where we're challenged on biofuels, it's having enough. And so it's, we'll do a lot of discussion on energy ratios, but they don't equal dollars. There's a lot of other things going on. And in fact, um, uh, a study in 2010 of some of my former colleagues at the University of Minnesota, and some economists up there basically said, if we took the entire U.S. soybean crop for biodiesel, 
we can only replace 60% of our current diesel usage for the nation. So the real problem is making enough. Biodiesel is actually a very nice fuel. And it also comes down to this, to always this dilemma of do we grow food to grow people or to, to feed people or feed cars. So we're kind of putting the idea on the shelf of we're not worried about making biodiesel to put in the gas stations where I can buy it right now. We're more looking at what can we do for the ag sector. I would like to get growing food less dependent on petroleum if possible. That's, several of us in the state have been thinking about that. So should farmers or should they even think about making biodiesel for their own use? You know, make it on farm or make it in a cooperative arrangement and use it locally. And it's a maybe. That's what we think is a maybe. Uh, you've got to count, take into account the market value of the crop and the cost of production, obviously access to markets. Um, I've got some colleagues on campus who've been working with biodiesel production, so I go and quiz them. You know, what's the cost, to, you know, just the plant cost? Everything from squeezing it to making it everything to make a gallon of biodiesel, and they gave me a nice big range, one to two dollars a gallon. And that takes into account economies of scale and all kinds of things, cost of chemical. Probably, they kind of gave me an average price. It's not the most efficient one, but I'll say a buck and a half a gallon if, you, if I can get, you know, waste oil, that kind of thing. So the next thing is, we grow soybeans, but is there an oil crop that we can grow? And I'm going to quickly pretty much go to the bottom line here. The answer for soybeans is no. Every farmer understands this math. I'll just go down to the last one. I just picked a, a recent price for a diesel in our state. $4.20 a gallon. I can get one and a half gallons roughly per, of biodiesel per bushel of soybeans. That's a rough estimate. And so if, <laughs> so if current price of diesel is four twenty, that's like selling soybeans for $6.30. And every farmer goes, that's stupid when they're 14. So we really pretty much say soybeans are not a great idea. Uh, our yields are only good if we irrigate. And so it's just too, it's just too valuable for other things. So that guy's looking at canola. We're not, we're not North and South Dakota. We're not Montana or even parts of Minnesota that grow a lot of canola. We're not Canada either. But we actually have a very nice growing season in our fall and winter. We can grow great wheat, and this fits in the niche there. And there's actually more uh, than in some other southeastern states. I put a picture of the plant. For us, we are one of our number one weeds is wild mustard. Canola looks just like it, so crop rotation is very intense here. But we make a very nice oil, and then the, the meal itself is also a high-protein feed source for, for livestock. So, would it be a good crop? Well, we kind of go through the same thing real quickly. I mean, one thing about canola, in just in the last few years, it's gone from market prices of 5 bucks a bushel to $10 or maybe a little more. But again, right now, if I'm sitting in South Carolina, I have a place to sell it. So we really have, we grow it, we don't have an alternative market. That doesn't mean it's not coming, but we don't right now. So again, if it's 4, 420, it might be about uh, 2.8 gallons per bushel, roughly. That means it's like selling canola for 11.76. Well, in South Carolina and parts of Georgia, I don't even have the opportunity to get it. So this is looking okay for us. If I was sitting up in North Dakota and I could sell it for 13, I'd be asking myself several questions whether I should do this. <clears throat> There's also some advantages. This is actually some, I think it's, I can't remember, it was NDSU or SDSU colleagues looked at some of the value of canola biodiesel and pretty much showed, hey, it's got a better cetate number than, than soybean biodiesel or petrodiesel and it has a, a lower cloud point. You know, we don't have to worry about minus 30 in South Carolina, but it does get 20. And so we'll go to, we can use B100, we can, use blends and that kind of thing. So we've got lots of options there. For us, it's grown in the fall, just like our wheat crop. And we, we actually double crop. It's common for us to put out wheat, soybeans, follow it, or peanuts immediately afterwards. We can literally farm year-round if, if, we, if we want to. In other parts of the U.S., you can still put the legume following the canola rotation. And I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. It takes more nitrogen, sulfur, than, uh, than corn. But when we start looking at manure, we've got that. We've got sulfur especially. And in southeastern conditions, we can get yields from 30 to 50. We're going to use 30 to 70. I'll use 50 for a, uh, an average. If we've got center pivots, we can do obviously better than that. <clears throat> so 
A farm in our area could make about 112 to 140 gallons of biodiesel per acre from canola. And, but he's going to have to have, or she's going to have to have some sort of plant. It's going to have to have the press we're going to crush with no solvents. It's not worth the extra issue for that. And so either a person's going to have their own biodiesel plant or they're going to be in a cooperative arrangement. We've got several livestock producers growing, you know, 1,300, 2,000 acres of row crop land. But they look at this and go, hey, me and these three guys, we probably could do this. So that's the kind of idea we're kind of throwing out there for our guys to look at. So that's obviously important. From a nutrient management standpoint, the first thing we look at for looking at manure is what is what is the recommendations for fertilization? 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre, 45 pounds of P2O5 per acre, and 60 of potash per acre. And then also it's very common to supplement with sulfur. And traditionally we haven't had to worry about that with the southeast, but we've reduced acid rain. <laughs> so now we actually have to supplement five, six, seven pounds of sulfur. So We've actually got that. We, we soil test for it, and, and we, we do that in South Carolina. But the reality is, is we've got this. We've got this in poultry litter. We've got this in swine waste. We've got this in dairy waste. We've got this in turkey waste. Um, and we can use it as a second crop falling soybeans. We can do it in other things. So we do a aggressive rotation around our farms. So we did a guy with Wilbur. We currently don't have a South Carolina canola budget. He's working on it. But he had a wheat budget for our state. We look, used things from our North Carolina economists and actually some others around the region. We also set prices. These are actually um, some mean prices from 2011 for nitrogen, 71 uh, cents a pound of nitrogen, 61 cents a pound for P2O5, and 55 cents per pound of K2O. I'm going to credit all of it. And here's the thing here. I'll just say this because I don't want to get off on nutrient management. What we are finding we can do quite well in South Carolina is we use soybeans and peanuts as scrubber crops. In other words, I'll go ahead and fertilize based on nitrogen on a wheat crop, and I can come behind it with soybeans, and I could have net zero increase in, in soil test phosphorus. If I don't double crop, I can still put it in a sequence and still get a pretty good use of carryover. And in fact, our peanut specialists only want carryover P and K. They don't want us to fertilize peanuts. So this fits right within the bounds of what we normally do in South Carolina and much of the Southeast. So that's different for the Midwesterns, I know. But uh, in this budget, we've got, the, we've got lime, herbicides, pesticides, seed, and all that stuff. And also petrodiesel still is assumed in production cost. So we rough out the, the, these uh, annual variable costs using modifications of wilderness and others' budgets. We're basically zeroing out the fertilizer requirements. Uh, we made a few, didn't make any adjustments on the labor machinery. It probably is a little higher than what we assume there with, with, the, with the manure, but it really depends on which one. If we're irrigating ethanol, it's pretty cheap. If we're spread litter, it's a little more. So we didn't worry about that at this point. But the bottom line is, if I go out and buy fertilizer, the assumed prices, it costs me $6.24 on my annual variable cost to grow that bushel of canola. If I have manure as a nutrient source, I'm going to scavenge with a later legume, I'm down to $3.47. Okay? I'm looking at, I want to look at what a, a budget is on producing biodiesel though. So if I get that down to what's the purchase fertilizer, what's the cost me per gallon of biodiesel? It's, uh, with purchase fertilizer, the canola itself costs me $2.23 a gallon. That's my input cost just from the canola, just for the grain, into the biodiesel price. On the manure side, it's $1.24. Basically, in this scenario, we're looking at about a 44% reduction. Basically, nutrients are costing us about that much. In South Carolina, most budgets, the, the, the MPK part of the budget runs 30 to 50% of the total annual variable cost. So it's a big deal to us. Current um, prices, like we said, to make it's around one to two. It depends on a lot of things, your chemical and your, really equipment capacity. Are we utilizing a well just like a milk and parlorate or combine or anything else? So we put in a budget here. We're putting everything on a per gallon biodiesel basis because that's really what I want to know. What does it cost me to produce it per, on a per gallon basis? So with fertilizer, and I have no credit for any meal here. This is just straight up. So there's my canola cost. And then I'm just going low, medium, high for the production cost. So, you know, if I look at the medium, it's 373 to make it if I buy fertilizer. 
It's 274 if I use my manure. But I don't have any byproduct value. Um, we're assuming 234 a ton for canola meal. That's also quite volatile. It goes up and down. So it's so yield about three quarters of a ton of meal per acre with a value about 175.50 an acre. But again, I want to put it on a per gallon biodiesel basis. So that's a, that's a credit of $1.25 a gallon of biodiesel, which is a pretty significant number. Because guess what? It's just it's right in there with my cost to produce the gallon of biodiesel. So I can put that credit in on both of them, and I make a pretty significant reduction in what it costs me to make a gallon of biodiesel on farm or in a co cooperative arrangement. Again, this low, medium, high is kind of giving us an idea of, you know, if I don't get good economy of scale, I'm going to be a call it two dollars. If I've got great economy of scale, maybe I can make it for a buck. It's probably going to be closer to buck fifty a gallon. If I'm using manure. So this is one of those first brush kind of things that we look at. And I've got some producers looking at this one. You know, we're on enough land and we're actually increased grain production in what we call a fertile crescent of our state. We're quit we're gonna stop buying as much Midwestern corn to feed pigs and chickens. And so this fits in with some of what we're doing in other ways. I don't have testing costs. There's still gonna be some testing costs because if I want to put it in a tractor and not void warranty. I gotta sh sh show it makes certain quality requirements. If I'm gonna sell it to somebody for on road use, I gotta pay taxes. And make it in the taxes. So it doesn't have any of that on there. So you could tack that on to this price. To give you kind of an idea, I'm just on a thousand gallons, and I got producers that need 10,000 gallons a year. So more than that. But uh, if I get 35 bushels per acre, I need 10. 50 is what I assume from my little analysis here. That means for every thousand, to get a thousand gallons, I need a little better than seven acres. So we're not looking at huge acreages, and I've got a lot of landowners who are crop producers and animal producers who are looking at, hey, you know, I can, I can rotate this aggressively, put this in my crop rotation sequences, and I think we can do this. This is not something that's pie in the sky. We're not going to be dependent on a market for canola. We're going to use ourselves. The big challenge will be getting the value of that meal. In the short term, they may be put into some some backgrounding some cattle with that in the background to type ration. In other words, get it off the hoof. Get the value of the hoof because I can't go sell it. In the future, we expect if this started being large, um, our, we have a lot of poultry and swine integrators who will start purchasing, purchasing that and using it with their soybean meal and rations. That's where we eventually want to go, back to the feed meal that's feeding the chickens and pigs and whatever. So, should farmers look at making biodiesel for their own use? <laughs> maybe, maybe not if they don't have animal manure. You know, our producers have got the manure and got the land have definitely got the advantage. And then we also encourage them, you know, this is just enough to get your interest peaked. It shows you there might be an opportunity here, but to kind of sharpen the pencil and really look what their costs are and their ability to really get that meal value to get the, the best price. And with that, I'm finished. Just to double check, the, the, the costs of making the biodiesel didn't include anything around the capital cost for the equipment to crush. That's the annualized cost, to own it and run it. That wasn't in there? Or That's in there, that dollar to two bucks a gallon. I, I went to my guys that have the plants. They got experimental plants, they've designed full scale plants. I'd say, back out and give me a number. You know more about it than I do. That's the dollar. And I'm actually, there's some research plants for up three bucks. I said, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I want, you know, reasonable scale plants. And I said, okay, a buck to two bucks a gallon. The two dollar gallon would be quite small and you don't use it very often. You can even go to three dollars if you're really bad. So getting the economy of scale on your crusher and your biodiesel setup. I mean, you can put it, we could put a small one in half this room easy. Okay, you can put them on a trailer. Yeah, we have one on a trailer at Clemson. It's kind of high. Because we, you know, we don't run much through it. <laughs> we, we do use canola, but we, you know, we're not producing. We're just showing how to do it. I'm not. I've got colleagues that are doing that. So I went to them to get those numbers. I, that's not my expertise. They, they had it. They did it. They backed it out and gave me a. So here's a range. That's the best they give me. So. Yes. Too many farmers you know have run a system like that. This is something we just started talking about recently. We actually use this as part of our confined animal manure managers program. So this is we give a class on this, a two-hour class. And uh, I think we're really the next step of we need a group to do it. Actually, I'd like to get my colleagues with the trailer and go do a training at one of our experiment stations and let people just see how to do it. There's a lot of interest, but they just 
all I want to kick the tires. But, you know, when I talk to producers, you know, especially my large landowners, they perk up and they go, dang, well, look at this. So, so we're kind of on the front end of this in our state. It's, we're, just, we're just trying to get entrepreneurs, you know, we've got to get entrepreneurs thinking so that they'll do things. Yes, ma'am. Have you looked at using the oil as straight vegetable oil rather than converting it to biofuel? Um, you can. I mean, when I was in graduate school, I mean, undergraduate school at the University of Georgia, we ran, uh, we had, a, in fact, I drove the tractor that was 100% soybean, soybean oil. Actually, canola oil would be better. But you do eventually end up gumming up injectors. And um, the best additive for that scenario is diesel. So we'd blend typically 50-50, and that would work okay. Here, we're literally looking in the summertime, maybe running B100. And then when, when we need to use tractors, even in our winter, we might back down to B80, maybe B50, something like that. So. The other point is you may void a warranty on equipment if you don't make biodiesel out of it. That's actually probably one of the biggest issues there, too. Yes, so does no oil have any sulfur in it, or is that... Um, I can't tell you right off. It's not real high sulfur. I think most of the sulfur stays with the meal when they press. I think it stays in the meal. It's like protein stays, most protein stays in the meal. Yes. How are you doing this into the rotation again? We have many rotations and sequences. Um, a very common practice is to double crop wheat in the winter and follow it with soybeans. And then the next year go to corn. Maybe the next year go cotton. The next year come back, you know, to wheat and soybeans. That's just one, but we have many because we literally plant wheat depending on where you're on the state, October, November. We actually fertilize wheat in January and February. And then we're harvesting early, way earlier than you guys are even thinking about. So, so in the upper Midwest, huh? Well, when would the canola go in? Same time as wheat. It occupies the same uh, agronomic niche for us as wheat does. We also actually ha happen to get better rainfall patterns <laughs> for our small grains than we do corn. We actually need to irrigate, even though we get 48 inches of rainfall a year, to grow a good corn crop because the rainfall fall patterns and not amounts. And we're seeing more irrigation 